You are listening to Natural Born Alchemist. Welcome to episode number 135 of the Natural Born Alchemist podcast. My name is Alex and I'll be your host. Have you ever wondered who killed John F. Kennedy? Or what really happened on 9-11? Have you ever had any interest in knowing who controls the world? And who those people who control the world, who they really are and what they really want? And maybe you have also asked yourself, how can a weird little man called Adolf rise to such power when he had nothing to begin with? Could it be that he was funded by people that are still around today? People that we elect as our leaders? And... Would you really want to know? If you're interested in such topics, then you should really watch the documentary JFK to 9-11, Everything is a Rich Man's Trick. It's a three and a half hour long film, but don't be scared about that because it's still shorter than watching the first two Transformers movies. And uh, you'll get nothing from watching them. And I suggest you rather watch this documentary. And in this episode, I am joined by the historian and filmmaker Francis Richard Connolly, who is the man behind this excellent documentary, JFK to 9-11, Everything is a Rich Man's Trick. And he also narrates it. So, let's get the show going. 9-11 was in reality just another CIA special effects movie production. Because the truth about Auschwitz and the entire Nazi war machine is that they were essentially no different to McDonald's. They were American business enterprises abroad, businesses which the richest European families invested in and businesses which, because of slave labor, made obscene profits, which Prescott Sheldon Bush took and placed in a blind trust, which later financed a Bush political dynasty, which produced two presidents of the United States, his son, George Herbert Walker Bush, and his grandson, George Walker Bush. So thanks for for being on the podcast. You're very welcome. And just briefly, can you tell the listeners who you are and, and what you do? Uh, that's an interesting uh, <laughs> original approach, Alex. Uh, well, hello uh, to uh, all the listeners of Alex. I'm Francis Richard Connolly. I'm a writer and film director. Uh, I'm suppose I've got a well, I have got a global reputation now for my movie JFK to 9/11. Everything, everything is a rich man's trick. Uh, and uh, well, <laughs> I, d- I don't want to go on and on, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I, I think most people have most people have heard of me by now. Let's face it. So. You know, there are a lot of so-called conspiracy documentaries on YouTube. What I think makes your film a bit different is that it doesn't feel so much that it's about a lot of uh, empty theories. It's it's very grounded in facts that anybody could check up. Um, and uh, how did you go about doing that? Ah, oh, gee, man. Uh, you know, can I thank you from the bottom of my heart? For saying that, <laughs> it's about it's about time <laughs> someone said that. The reason that I'm reacting in this way is that I'm getting so tired um, of, of uh, what, what what in itself actually is a is a conspiracy. Uh, uh, people um, who are, who've acquainted themselves with the public comments sections are not only of my original film, but of all of the rip off versions of which there are so many. Um, will know that on the public comment sections, you th- there's this constant nagging saying, eh, you know, well, why does this man not provide uh, a list of, of sources and a big big biography and all, all the rest of it? Uh, and I'm, I'm getting really tired of that because, as you say, you know, my movie is grounded in 
historical fact. It is grounded in historical records, uh, many of which I was able to go to the original sources for. And, um, you know, anybody, as you say, can check these out. And the thing that uh, I've been most delighted by is that uh, many, many people, in response to that sort of little conspiracy that's going on online, uh, have said, you know, I have checked out what this man has claimed online. I've done the research myself, in reverse, as it were, uh, and everything he says is true. And I, 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 thank you for the question, Alex, because I'm very glad to have the opportunity to thank those people now, because, as you say, it it is grounded in uh, you know in historical records. Um, I, when I was on, uh, I think it was the was it the Justin Stelman show? I think it was on the Justin Stelman show. That was the first time that I was asked about Smedley Butler and uh, and how all of that came about, because. I heard about the claim that uh, that Smedley Butler had made, and heard about the business plot, and it was it was written down online. And I noticed that as soon as that came out, that there seemed to be a concerted effort by the disinformation machine that people are so aware of now to say, "Oh no, 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 no! Uh, Smedley Butler didn't know what he was talking about." No, 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 he, he didn't get it, uh, he was confused, he was mistaken, he was this, he was that, he was the other. <clears throat> and some wonderful human being, who I, I've thanked many times and praised many times, and I'd, 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 I'd just, I'm so curious, I would love to know who this man or woman is. Can you just, because uh, not everybody, I imagine, has seen the film, can you just briefly, who was Smedley Butler? And Smedley Butler was the man who, who revealed the business plot. Anybody who wants to watch my film will find uh, the movie of him uh, that he, he made on Movie Tone to expose the business plot. And some wonderful human being who knew that it still existed found it in the archives somewhere in America. It must have been in America. I can't believe it was in an archive here. Although I could be wrong about that. But uh, and they found it and they they put it on YouTube and you know that had the dual effect of for one thing utterly destroying and showing up the disinformation machine for what it really is. Anybody who was aware of the, that uh, what was going on, on at the time, they'd be able to see straight away. Well, this is clearly you know this is absolute rock solid proof that what was said about Smedley Butler was all disinformation because it, it all was. And the great thing was that once it was there. I could put it in my movie instead of simply quoting from things that he said with, <clears throat> with absolute rock solid proof because he's there on the screen that he said it. So once once again, I'm uh, so, you know, I, I, from the bottom of my heart to whoever it was who loaded up that, uh, you know, Smedley Butler film to YouTube, I, I, I thank them and thank them over and over again. I, you know, I, I, it, it, it's such an important part of the movie. It's such an important part of that, uh, section uh, where I'm trying to explain to people, you know, um, exactly how the business plot came about and who was involved and how America so easily could have become a, a Nazi country at, at that time. I mean, all of the rich people wanted it. So I thank you very much for that question. Last. Thank you very much for that one. I, I, I knew about these things before I saw your documentary. That's why I was so, it was so nice to see it put together because even though uh, you are aware of many different things you know it's nice to see it all linked together in a continuity kind of way and the fact all these things about how American uh, corporations funded Hitler and that the second world war and probably most wars in modern times have been uh, just a business a business and I'm thinking about the wars we have now are also business there's always some sort of business behind it Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, w- I wouldn't want to add anything to what you're saying. What you're saying is true. Syria, Korea, it, it doesn't matter. Well, I, mean, it's, it's, <clears throat> I mean, we can quote Smedley Butler again here, can't we? Because his book, any, and, and anybody can look at it now, and, and it's very short. You, you can read it in, a, in, a, in an afternoon. Smedley Butler was right when he said that war is just a business and that all he was was a gangster for capitalism. And that was why he became so disillusioned. Have you ever had any... Because, you know, 
the most confusing thing for people when they look at different conspiracy videos is that they're they're either like talking about uh, the devil or sat- something is satanic, or they are blaming the Jews. It's it's so uh, uh, distinct. But yours is not like that. It's just saying uh, as it is. And I've always been fascinated about the Hitler era because it's it's confusing to many people that rich so-called Jewish bankers and those kind of people funded the killing of innocent Jews. And then later when people mention this, they are anti-Semitic. It's, it's like such a chaotic thing, you know? Well, ch- chaotic, my friend, is exactly the, the right word. And um, I'm sure that all of your listeners... Um, <clears throat> excuse me will be will be tired of, of of this thing as well um it's hard to think what is what is the the best way to to sort of answer this i mean i, I don't know if one can answer it um uh, you know maybe it's best to simply uh, for you and i just simply you know to to talk uh, about it and um i don't know to maybe to warn anybody who's uninitiated I mean, if, if there are, i'm always very aware that um, in all these interviews that I've given, that there can be young people listening who uh, maybe are, are just starting to put their foot in the water with this, uh, or the, sorry, their toe in the water for the first time, and and wondering, you know, where they should look for information and who who should they believe, and if they look on my, you know, uh, look at my movie and then look at the comments pages, you, you see this thing which you've you've alluded to already. Where you've got comment after comment after comment after comment. It's the Jews. 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 On and on and on and on and on. Uh, and and you know it 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 just never ends. And it it I'm sure that it is difficult for people. I'm sure that it is uh, very sort of confusing for people. But I think that 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 in order to try and simplify it, in in to 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 some degree, um, I th- I think that what people need to understand, first and foremost, is that it does not matter, because it really doesn't, where a particular oligarch family is based, and what their ethnic background is, and what their country's beliefs, their nation is is supposed to believe or not. None of that matters at, at all. As you say, it's very clear the, the, this group of you know J- Jewish bankers who you know are, are now being referred to as Zionists by so many broadcasters. It's very clear that they were instrumental in bringing about a Holocaust which did murder you know millions of Jews who had, as it were, d- done nothing. Um, so you know you have to remember that all of these people be they of a Jewish background or an Anglo-Saxon background or an Oriental background or a Scandinavian background, it doesn't matter. What they are about is money and power, first and foremost, always. That is what they're about. And they don't care who dies. You know, it confuses a lot of people because they say, well, come on, surely rich Jews wouldn't kill other Jews, but, you know, that's like saying that the Queen wouldn't kill other British people. In order to stay in power, she would. You know, the British flag, the British nation, and everything that the British are supposed to stand for means nothing to the Queen whatsoever. It means nothing to Prince Philip. They simply practice selfishness as a religion. And we, they think, are simply there. This is the oligarch mentality, to serve them. That's the oligarch mentality. They look at everyone in the world as a drone serving a queen bee. That's how, that's how they look at life. So, it, it, you know, it, it, I can see, you, you know, why you want to bring this up, Alex. I, I absolutely can, because an awful lot of people are getting very sick of this dichotomy, you know, between between uh, you know the Zionist thing and, and, and the Jewish thing, and a lot of people are saying you know it's impossible to discuss this 
uh, you know, with intellectual courage. Because on the one hand, if you dare to say, yes, there is something in this big Zionist plot, you're anti-Semitic. And you can't be anti-Semitic. But on the other hand, if you dismiss it altogether, then, you, you know, there's, there's a, there seems to be this big voice saying, well, you, you know, you, you're helping Zionists, you see. And, be, and because there, there is, as it were, no easy dividing line, because, you know, let, let's face it, the people who were being accused, you know, like Netanyahu, who were, who were being accused of, you know, ha- trying to hatch a, a Zionist plot to take o- over the world, um, you know, they are all bound up with Israel and, and with uh, Israel's, uh, you know, needs as, as a nation. So, yes, it's very difficult to talk about. Uh, yes, it's, uh, you know, a, a real sort of hot potato. Um, I simply hope that people will realize that there's nothing that I am afraid to talk about. What I am determined that will not happen is that anybody will, you know, be able to manipulate my own thoughts, my own speech or my own work uh, in, in a way which will make it seem as if I'm blaming one particular group of people for the ills of, of the of the world. Uh, there's a, a, a German, uh, I'll say, fan of mine uh, who wrote to me uh, about six months ago. A very uh, decent man, and he said that the thing that he found most appealing about my documentary was that I didn't, you know, lay all of the blame on Anglo-Saxons. Didn't lay all the blame on the white race, the black race, the Orientals, the Jews, anybody. You know, he, he said that that was the the best thing about it was that. You know, I, 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 I did focus on on the right people and, and didn't blame one particular uh, you know nation. You know, like so many people have blamed the, the the German people, his 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 own people, and he knew that that's not fair, and that was what he found most uh, appealing. So you know, I am not afraid to discuss anything to do with the Jews, not afraid to discuss anything to do with what are now being referred to as Zionists. The thing that is the difficulty, and I'm sure you can see this, Alec, is getting reliable information about these people all the time because there is such an effort being made every day, uh, you know, with, with disinformation. It's very, very difficult to get, you know, reliable information as to exactly how much power uh, the, if you want to call it the Zionist lobby, has over uh, the American media. It's very difficult to um, so- separate the wheat from the chaff and, and uh, be able to pick out exactly how much power the Zionist lobby has over um, British politics. Because you know, there's an awful lot of people who, who claim that even British politics is, is all controlled by uh, Zionists. So, um, you know, this isn't something I share from. I'm glad you've, you, you've raised it. It is something that I intend to look into uh, more in the future. At the moment, I'm... Uh, I don't want to give any, you know, uh, hard and fast um, opinions as as to how much we can blame uh, people who are now being called Zionists for uh, the ills of the world. What I'm not ever going to allow is the idea that Anglo-Saxons are not guilty, because who could who could believe that? Is the Queen a Zionist? Is George Bush a Zionist? I mean, come on, you know, we, we, we've got to we've got to stay real with this. So, and maybe it's also only benefits these people to call them Zion or Jews or whatever because they can hide behind that. Because I don't think they themselves care about country or nationality or anything. You know, it's more as you say, uh, they only care about their own interests, and it doesn't matter. They can be Chinese; it doesn't matter to them. You know. Exactly, yeah. I mean, the, the the Chinese oligarchs don't care about the Chinese, <laughs> and they'll, they'll quite happily slaughter. I mean, the, the Chinese governments throughout the history have slaughtered their own uh, people. This is uh, this is why, as as you say, it's it's difficult for people to, you know, to understand. Uh, you know, why would they slaughter their own people or have anything to do with? Uh, you know, genocides and holocausts against their own people. But that's not how oligarchs look at life at all. You know, they, they don't see them as, the, as, as their own people. They see themselves as the elite and they see the rest of the planet 
as just drones serving them. And it doesn't matter who dies, who gets hurt, who gets raped, you know, how many children get murdered, you know, sodomized. It, it just doesn't matter. They think that we are all there just for them. And that's how uh, the richest people who happen to be of Jewish ethnicity look at the world as, as well. That, that, I think, is about as much as, as, as you can... Um, that's about as much meat as I can put on the bone, I would say. What, what, what is fascinating also is that, you know, it took so long for them to tear down the wall in Berlin, and now they built a wall in Israel, and they're talking about building a wall in, in, uh, in the United States, and I'm thinking, like, don't nobody remember that we finally got the wall down, and now it's all about walls again? Exactly, my friend, yeah. yeah. Well, you know... The <laughs> See, that's that's Donald Trump trying to convince uh, the world once again that divide and rule is a good idea. Um, and that's that's Donald Trump, who is, uh, as I said in my last interview, just a puppet, um, you know, trying to convince the world uh, of, you know, the, the, well, the, he's trying to convince the world of the Mexican boogeyman, uh, you know, and, and other people are trying to convince the world of, of the ISIS boogeyman or the Muslim boogeyman. We've always got to have the boogeyman. And, you know, if there's a wall, then people think, well, it's got to be there, you know, to, to keep somebody out who's who's bad. Um, you're, you're absolutely right, my friend. You know, we, we tore down the Berlin Wall. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could tear down all the walls between countries and between ethnicities? And, and you know, wouldn't it be wonderful if we, we could tear down all of the barriers between Arabs and Jews and black and white and one thing or another? But that isn't their plan that isn't their strategy they want to focus all the time on our differences and always want to sow mistrust between one man and another throughout the world rather than to have a an international brotherhood the thing that that the oligarchs fear i think probably more than anything else and this is why they you know they are scared of the internet um and, and what it's doing you know they fear international brotherhood more than I think they they fear anything. If you know, if Arabs and Jews have buried their differences, and blacks and whites have buried their differences, and you know, Chinese and Japanese have buried their differences, and we all acted together in concert to try and establish, you know, a, a fair world, and, and a, you know, where you know everybody truly was equal. That's the thing that the oligarchs uh, fear most. So that you know, it's all part of their strategy, my friend, to to build old walls, as you say. What's well, so hard for me to grasp is that you know, if I have five hundred million dollars real estate all over the world and never have to think about anything I buy, then why would I? I can't imagine myself trying to lift a finger to get more. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yes, Alex. But you see, again. Fantastic question, and, and this is the thing that, um, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to get this across to, um, to, 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 to people. But, you know, Adam and John in my last interview um, were, <clears throat> were very um, intelligent in the way that they were trying to discuss this and, and very intelligent in the way that they were trying to make people aware of how differently oligarchs think and uh, we had quite a bit of fun actually because they, they put um, a similar kind of question to me and I had to say to them uh, thank you for the question I'm not going to tell you <laughs> and, and it was uh, it was it, it was a little bit of fun because this is what I mainly want to go into uh, in my next film or in you know movies uh, beyond that you see the the question is not just the fact that the oligarchs always do go on and on and on and on, trying to accrue more and more and more money, more and more and more power. What, and, and, and as you say, it just seems so completely insane. I mean, it, it's, it's like that line from the, uh, the, you know, the Wall Street movie where uh, Charlie uh, Sheen says, you know, well, how many, you know, how many yachts can you water ski behind? How much is enough? It's it's been said in, in in many films. It was said in the movie movie Chinatown by by Jack Nicholson. You know, you see these people who've got billions and trillions, and, and you think to yourself, well, why don't you just relax 
and take it easy and, <laughs> and just in, enjoy your money. Why do you why do you want to stop other people from getting a good lifestyle? Why do you want to keep the public subjugated? Why do you want to keep them in poverty? Why do you do this century after century? But this is what the oligarchs are all about. Their lifestyle is primarily about power and privilege. Above all things, it's about privilege. You've got to remember, Alex, that they can get off a plane anywhere in the world and just walk off. They don't have to. Sh- they, don't, they don't have anybody looking at their bags. They don't have anybody checking their passport. They can just go go wherever they want, anywhere in the world, in complete freedom. While you and I are being, you know, shoved around by a policeman. And uh, I mean, I can remember the first time that I went to uh, to America. Got got off the uh, the plane at uh, JFK Airport, and the experience of from getting off the plane until I was finally out there, you know, in the reception area, was quite awful. I mean, we had you know all these massive American cops with dark glasses on, and they're shoving everybody, and all all you're hearing is ID, ID. Where's your ID? Where's your ID? Snarling at you, biting at you, sniping at you, and giving you the impression that you know you're just a a, a horde of animals. The, the rich don't have to put up with that. And when they go to Wimbledon, they walk straight into the best seat. And they've got private jets while the rest of us have to go on commercial flights. What I, what I always struggle to get across to people is that if we had a fair and just society uh, of equal human beings, their lifestyle is gone. It's It's over. They don't go into the best seats anymore. They don't have private jets anymore. They, you know, they, they, what they regard as their proper place and their proper status in society is over the moment that we make a world of free and equal human beings. And this, Alex, is why my interview, uh, well, my, my first two interviews uh, with uh, Rodrigo Soto on Transcendent Radio and why my first interview with uh, on uh, with Andy Young on Rock and Tours News. This is why they were both banned by YouTube. You see, when I was discussing this and trying to explain, uh, you know, why the oligarchs treat the rest of us in, in, in the way that they do, as soon as you know they they try they put them out, YouTube banned them because this is the thing that they do not want discussed more than anything else in the world. This is what, you know, this this th- point that you've raised, this is the thing that they least want to have any intellectual discussion about. You cannot ever analyze or criticize the system as a system. What The, the whole point of the oligarchs, day in, day out, is to try to convince the world that this, the, the basic Western capitalist model that we have, the basic capitalist system that we have, you know, will not be analysed, it will not be touched. It's fine. That basic system has got to remain in place. That's what, that's, the whole of mainstream media has this sort of undercurrent in it, which is telling you every day, the system that we've got, you don't need to mess with it. It's a good system. And the reason for that is that they know that so long as we have a capitalist system, we'll always have oligarchs, private individuals, owning corporations, owning countries, owning giant cruise line ships, owning jumbo jets, owning uh, chains of hotels. And so long as we've got that basic situation, we'll always have a hierarchical society and the little guy will never get a good deal and he'll never get a fair deal, you see. And and, and that's why you, you, you're never allowed to criticise. This, this that you've raised here is the main thing that they do not want any intellectual discussion about and it's you know i suppose we should at least be glad that you and i at least can't do this and, and that theoretically the rest of the world can at least listen to to what we're saying and, and, and make up their own minds about it but you know i've talked about it before and I, i've no doubt I'll, I'll wind up talking about this uh, again but now that now that i've said what i've said in the last five minutes um you know this interview will probably be banned by youtube again Simply because I've I've I've, I've discussed this, so, you know, it, it's happened twice before. So um, you know, you 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 probably got a fight on your hands with YouTube, Alex. Now, just because you've asked that question. <laughs> no, I look forward to it. Uh, 
So how how did you get into all this? I mean, uh, did you just stumble into it, or what was it that sparked the initial interest? Uh, it's funny, Alex, that that people um, right from the very beginning. I mean, my first interview uh, was on the Richie Allen show, and uh, obviously this was the first um, question that, that Richie asked me. But ever since then, I've noticed that that even though <clears throat> I answered it quite comprehensively. On his show, um, I've noticed that people are, are still asking me about this, and there always seems to be um, <laughs> a, a sort of a, a, a I don't want to say hidden agenda uh, in the question, but people always seem to be inferring that, or, well, it, maybe that's the wrong word. It's just that what what I seem to get from, with this question is it's it, it somehow it's it, it's loaded, in that people seem to be saying, well, you know, you're only one man. <laughs> How could one man have done all of this? Uh, you know, on its own. It's a compliment and it's very nice, and you know, I I I, I really uh, appreciate it. Um, I, I really do. That <laughs> this question keeps coming up. But for the, for those who've heard this before, I apologise. I'll try to say it quickly. Um, basically, um, the Kennedy assassination was a, this terrible traumatic event in my childhood. It's the thing that most sticks in my mind. I, I know exactly where I was, what I was doing when I heard. I can remember the awful newsreels. I remember seeing the Orville Nix film repeated on BBC again and again and again. And there was this terrible upset um, and grieving not only in my house, but in the whole street. I can remember the adults, my next door neighbors, crying over Kennedy's death. There was all this trauma. And the thing that was, the, the residue that was left hanging was that, oh, you know, we, we had all this, all, people now can't appreciate how much hope was invested in Kennedy and how much he was loved around the world as a decent man and the real deal. People today have got this cynical attitude to politicians, quite rightly, that basically they're all crooks and it's just a matter of choosing the, the, the lesser evil. But everybody knew that Kennedy was good. Everybody everybody did. You know, he was he was loved throughout the world. And so the the shock and the trauma was was overwhelming. There's me as a little boy trying to make uh, sense of it. And uh, when I went to school um, when I, uh, you know, was sort of like 13, 14, um, I remember look, just coming across this book that they gave us in history classes where we, we started to look at the Kennedy assassination and, and there was just this one sentence that burned itself into my brain where, where it was saying, you know, on the 22nd of November 1963, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated President Kennedy with three rifle shots fired from, you know, the Texas School Book Depository. And it was written in a way as if it was saying, and no one could ever doubt this. And there's me sitting there at the age of 14 thinking, what? What, what's, what, what is this? No matter how you read it, something in the, in the words smelled bad. There was something I remember that passage, I remember the book, and there was something just wrong in all of it. And the more I asked my teachers what was wrong here and, and could they explain it, the more I found I couldn't get an answer. So as I grew into a, young, into a man and, and started, you know, uh, doing my own research, um, I just developed this uh, lifelong interest in the Kennedy assassination. And um, watched things like The Men Who Killed Kennedy, which was very unsatisfying. It didn't get you anywhere, anywhere nearer to the truth. And I started to wonder then if even the Kennedy assassination maybe was bogus and it had some kind of hidden agenda, which turned out to be true uh, years later. So basically, um, that was the thing that you know got me interested in, in the first place. Um, as I've explained in other interviews, the, mo the moment that um, I actually started researching and writing in earnest was when I discovered the uh, E. Howard Hunt uh, fake deathbed confession online. 
when I first got broadband at, at home, and that's now about uh, eight, nine years ago. Uh, that, that, that was the moment that uh, led to you know, us having this conversation now. Because that, once I looked at that, and after several weeks realized that it was all bogus, uh, then all of a sudden I realized I've, I've got to write about this. And, uh, it, and it developed from there. I always think about what Bill Hicks said when he said something like, isn't it funny that Lee Harvey Oswald was a loner with wife and kids? <laughs> Did Bill Hicks say that? Yeah, something along those lines. That uh... Well, that's Bill Hicks for you. Um, actually, I'm glad you brought up Bill Hicks because um, the American establishment, well, the, the establishment, I should say, did everything they could to stop uh, the public from... Um, getting to know about Bill Hicks, the, uh, the, who is a comedian, by the way, for any of you listeners who don't know. Um, I had never heard of Bill Hicks until um, he was mentioned by John Cleese one night on, on, on TV. And it's interesting that they were just as successful in keeping George Carlin's work, uh, particularly away from the, the British. No one in, in Britain had heard of George Carlin until just about sort of last year when someone started uh, loading all of his... Uh, his videos on, uh, onto YouTube. Um, you know, all of the men like Bill Hicks and George Carlin who have brilliantly um, examined uh, the establishment and, you know, the, the truth of our modern world in their art, uh, the establishment has done everything they can to, to make sure that they kept a low profile. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, that you've uh, raised Bill Hicks. The point of um, him being alone with a wife and kids <laughs> is, uh, you know, a, a, a typical Bill Hicks uh, observation. He was a very brilliant man, and I have no doubt whatsoever that he was murdered by the CIA in the same way as Aaron Russo was murdered. I, I think that they uh, deliberately gave him uh, cancer. That's uh, my view of, of Bill Hicks. What I think is interesting with all, in the last, like, three, four years, there's been multiple terrorist attacks. Usually used they've used a truck or a car or something like that. And every single time, the police always kill the person. But I always thought, which would be the you know protocol of any police officer would be, or, or a CIA kind of person, would be to try and get the person alive because you question them to get information. Then you can kill them, but... That that's the best uh, proof for me that there's something fishy going on because logically that's what you would do. You want to find out, you know, more about this guy, not kill them. You know, you make a very good uh, point, Alex. I mean, uh, you know, an awful lot of uh, the people listening to you tonight, you, you know, I'm sure that many of your listeners will be listening because they've already, you know, gone onto YouTube and typed in false flag terrorism and they've, you know, looked at all of the the proof. And I say proof because there is so much proof out there that you could take to court and absolutely have a slam dunk win um, that, you know, that all of our modern uh, terrorism is is phony. But I, I you know, think that your observation is, is terrific because, as you say, there's another very good reason to disbelieve in, in the phony terrorism because there's been several um, situations or at least, you know, this is what they say. There's been several situations where they could have captured what was supposed to be a, an ISIS terrorist rather than just, you know, shooting him uh, in, instantly. Um, you know, several times they, they, they could have been captured. But as you say, they've chosen not to and apparently, you know, shot the alleged uh, attacker on, on the scene. Um, you know, dead men as ever telling no no tales. So yes, it's it's another argument. Uh, you know, to, to for people to think about. Um, it's 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 another good observation. Uh, you know, as as to the fact that the all the terrorism is just one great big hoax. When I was younger, I used to be very interested in serial killers. I just found them fascinating. And in almost all cases where they caught the serial killer, who usually killed more people and also raped them and did other things to them, uh, they usually always caught them. You know, they never killed them when they captured them. They always caught them and investigated and, you know, then locked them up, you know. Yeah, like Ted Bundy, yeah. 
yeah yes that, that yeah that's very true i mean um if you if you look at the history of uh, of serial killers john wayne gacy uh, ted bundy the california rapist um uh the uh the doctor uh who uh killed all those old women in in britain his name is gacy from um yes i mean nearly always <clears throat> these people are, are caught aren't they and, and and brought to trial it's funny how they don't wind up shooting them once again, Alex, you know, I congratulate you on your, your observation. You know, why is it that the authorities are so inept at grabbing a live ISIS terrorist? It's a very good question, Alex, a very good question you asked. And if I was American, I, I would have been appalled and very angry that I would that I never saw Osama bin Laden on trial on American soil, you know, that he was dumped in the ocean well, exactly. <laughs> you know, once again, they could, it, I mean, it just would have been a farce, wouldn't it? You know, uh, I mean, there's the classic example, you see, of the the uh, the Muslim boogeyman. You see, it, it, that it, it, these people are simply there as as, as figureheads to uh, to frighten you. But and, but as you say, they can't ever have them alive and in a courtroom in a court of law where they can tell their side of the story because it would become so obvious so quickly. I mean, Bin Laden was on dialysis, for God's sake. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the, this there is recorded history proof that, that the man was sick and he was on dialysis for, dialysis for years and, and that he was visited in hospital by CIA agents while he was uh, on dialysis. Um, and that there was no way that, you know, that he could have ever coordinated a, a plot to bring down the you know the world uh, trade center ridiculous so can you talk a bit about your your new project and what you want to do and what it what it's about and, and all that no <laughs> this is this is what i did to him and john the other night um it's very difficult for me at the moment alex um this because so many people are pushing me to to, to say oh oh come on you know why don't you tell us a, a little bit about what, what you, you're planning to do? But, I, you know, up to now, I've managed to not even tell people what the title is going to be. The thing is, in the situation that, that, that I'm in, um, it's still exactly the same as it was sort of like three years ago, um, where I was desperate to, you know, try and keep what I was intending to do from the authorities. Because ha had they even been able to see the script for JFK to 9-11, everything's a rich man's trick. I would have never got it made, you know. God knows what they would have done, but I'm sure that they would have made sure that it was never, you know, committed uh, to, to video. So I'm still in the same situation. I don't mind saying that, going back to what we were talking about um, earlier, about the oligarchs and this crazy mentality that they've got, the big question is why they've got it. The big question is what has made them this evil and this crazy? And that really, to me, is the, is the big question that, that needs answering more than anything else in our world at this moment. And uh, that really is, is, is uh, what I'm hoping to, to try to, to look at in my next movie. But, uh, you know, it, will I ever get the chance to make it? I mean, they're doing everything they can't stop me um on uh, the uh, the last uh, show that i was on uh i explained to adam john that i think that the indiegogo crowdfunding campaign that uh, i tried uh, to put in place was uh, was sabotaged i think by the cia using the the dark web um it, it, there's no doubt that millions of people looked at the campaigning video that we had to make for, for it. It was a, just a five-minute video. It's still there online if anybody wants to, to look at it. If you just type in uh, the title of my film in Indiegogo, um, it will it, pop up on, on YouTube. But it was, uh, you know, even though millions of people watched the campaign video, um, um, you know, I, they wanted me to believe that only 50 donated to the, the campaign. Um, it's quite clear to me that the Indiegogo uh, inbox or, you know, whatever they have there uh, that, that takes in your uh, donations, that somehow they've been able to rig it 
so that it only accepted say one in every 10 or 20,000 uh, donations you see I think that's that's what's been uh, what's been done to me um, so uh, part of the reason I wanted to do this interview with you is to uh, tell people again that um, that was what happened with the Indiegogo campaign it was scuttled you know I was I was sabotaged and uh, what I'm gonna have to do is put together uh, some other strategy uh, to uh, try to establish an, an everything is a rich man's trick film fund that people uh, can donate to to um, from all over the world without too much difficulty. Um, the thing that it, that's you know we may try is to uh, just go around the internet altogether because it's, it's clear that they the oligarchs have, have got too much control over the internet. They could pretty well you know stop anything that they want to stop on, on the internet and uh, I think you know it's been mooted that we go back to uh, the idea of uh, recorded delivery or what's called registered mail in the United States uh, that, that we might simply ask people to just you know get an envelope put a ten dollar check in it and just send it to some PO box number uh, somewhere uh, but we, again you know if it's recorded delivery would they dare interfere with that um, it, it would be difficult for them, I think, to interfere with with that. Maybe they would, but th that's about the all like, I can think of it at the moment. Uh, this is the kind of difficulty that I'm that I'm having, making my next movie. You know, if the whole world was to turn around tomorrow, and as they ought to, and say, "Look, this is utterly outrageous. They've stopped this man's film." from appearing to be as popular as it really is because once again I want to say this that the hits on my movie have been underreported by 200 times according to Andy Young who is a Google Analytics expert he thinks that there may have been as, as many as a million uh, sorry a, bi uh, a billion hits I'm not saying that that means a billion people have watched it I know that an awful lot of people people have watched it twice but I could honestly um, believe that half a billion people in the English speaking world have seen my picture all the way from I mean I get letters from New Zealand Australia Canada Britain and uh, America in the English speaking world it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if the true figure is is half a billion people the problem now is can uh, we reach those half a billion people and get their support uh, so that I can uh, make another film um, you know anybody who wants to to write to me with offers of help uh, I'm always open to uh, offers of help, and I am getting a lot of them, but I, I could do with a lot more. But if the world tomorrow said, look, we've had enough of this, uh, and, and, and they all together, you know, demanded of their political leaders that, uh, you know, I've, I've got to stop being hounded by the security services and, al and allowed to make my films because they're important films there'd be very little that the establishment could do about it if the whole world acted together. But uh, at the moment, that's not happening, Alex. So that, that tells you a lot about people's apathy. Have you ever considered maybe as, a, as, a, as one measure is to, because that's not so costly, it's only time, is to make an audiobook. And then maybe by selling that, that money can fund making the film. I think, Alex, you know, many, many people have, uh, passed many many ideas to me and don't think for a moment that I don't appreciate the fact that people are trying to help I absolutely do um, when I was thinking about the funding people were you know suggesting all kinds of things including Bitcoin uh, and I thank all of those people I really do including yourself for giving it you know any time to uh, get giving any thoughts to, to this at all I, I appreciate it but um, you know television in, in this world is regulated and controlled to the de degree that it is and it has become nothing but a propaganda machine in the way that it now is because the oligarchs know and, and fully understand the extent to which um, it molds public uh, opinion you know my movie has had the impact that it's had because it's a movie uh, and it's you know it's it's really shocked the, the you know the socks off uh, so many people precisely because it's a film and uh, you can't have that kind of impact uh, when it's uh, it's just sound my friend I, it, you know 
I wish that that I could. But I think that you know, all of those images in my movie of the Holocaust, all those terrible pictures of all that human suffering and and all that human madness, and you know those corpses piled up high, and throughout our lives, we've always thought, you know, we knew what happened there. And the fact that I've turned that upside down and said, you know, you don't know what was behind this at all. That's what's unsettled people the most and shocked people the, the, the most, you see. And, uh, you know, there's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, I would always argue whose words because, you know, George Orwell's words are a lot more powerful than pictures at times. But having said that, you know, images like the the ones that you see in my movie, um, you know, of all those mass graves and corpses piled up in mountains, um, you know, they are the most emotive images in human history. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that's that's what I've, I've got to deal. I've, that's what I've dealt in. And I need to deal in that uh, again if I'm if my work is to have the impact that I want it to have. Every time I, I think about your film there's always w- just one single image that always pops up in my mind as my my own mind's representation of your film and that is when you have a, a still photograph i think it is of uh, german tanks and you you replace the german logo with the american flag i think for me that was always the most striking because all the way through my school years in history because i used to love history class You know, the first time we started the Second World War, it was fun. The second time we started it, it was not as fun. The third time, it started to get boring, and I started to ask my history teacher, can we please study something else than the Second World War, because I've heard it all too many times now. And then you just kept kept uh, repeating this Second World War. So that image is strong for me, because it, 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 it uh, destroyed... All those years in like one image. <laughs> well, that's very nice. That, well, that's that's good to know, Alex. I I, I imagine that that it's um, that other people, you know, have, have had uh, similar experiences. Actually, I know they have because p- people have have written to me to to say so. It's the image. I think that um, as far as I can tell from the letters that I've had, um, which seems to linger in most people's minds the most, and I noticed that. They've underlined this by putting uh, the image on uh, on YouTube images themselves with, without you know asking me a, about it, and that's the image of the uh, the American railway line going into uh, into Auschwitz. That's the one that seems to uh, have the biggest Im- impact of, uh, of all. That's that's the one that seems to to linger in the mind the the, the most. And uh, I'm very uh, you know. It, it, it's great to hear you. you great to hear you saying this because uh, I think actually, doesn't it, Alex? That makes my point of why we need images and why we need uh, film and why I need why I need to work in this way and, and why I do work in this way because you know uh, p- pictures can be and images can be such powerful things. I, I visited Auschwitz many many years ago and I. I uh... I, uh, you have to walk around with a guide, and I, I wasn't aware of the American corporation. It's not Americans, to be clear, for anyone listening. It's, it's corporations that were based in in America. I guess you could say that funded a lot of what was going on. But um, uh, to have asked the, just to see what she would have said, this guide, but she probably wouldn't have, uh, because, like you mentioned earlier. There is a when you I don't know if you've been at Auschwitz, but when you go into Auschwitz, there's a big sign that says you are not allowed to question anything here, and that sign always annoyed me. And I, I under initially I thought okay they have that sign because you have these Holocaust deniers, so maybe that's the reason they have it because some people deny the Holocaust. Ah uh, well no well you see Alex though. In the light of my movie, I wonder if now people will look at that sign in a different way and think that it's got nothing to do with Holocaust deniers and possibly it's got everything to do, you know, with the, the you know the suppression of, of of true history. That's really interesting. Is that sign 
put up everywhere in different languages. Yeah, if my memory serves me, it's it's not really a sign. It's like an engraving on the wall in many languages that what happened here is the truth and cannot be questioned or something like along those lines. Now, do you know, the, the main reason why that is so fascinating is because it is an absolute slap in the face of everything that we are supposed to believe. What is the Western world about? The Western world, more than anything else, is supposed to be about you and I and everybody else having freedom of thought and speech. And you go to the Holocaust Museum at Auschwitz and they deny you freedom of thought and speech. That is absolutely fascinating. I'm really glad you've told me that. And I'm really, you know, thinking that your listeners will be fascinated to hear that. I had no idea that that, that was the case. And you're not allowed to wander anywhere on your own either. You've, you've got to be with the guide all the time. Well, yes, when I was there, it was like uh, six years ago. I, I can't say how it is now, but that's what that's my experience from, from going there. You know, the, one of the reasons it fascinates me is that I can't help wondering... Um, what this um, historian uh, called David Cole, and I'm referring to the young man who uh, was working, I think it's now a good eight or nine years ago. He, 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 there are interviews of his um, online, uh, on, on YouTube, but he um, went himself not only to Auschwitz, uh, but to other concentration camps as well. And he was trying to find out whether there was any basis to the claim that many people were making, which was that the Holocaust was a hoax, or at least that it was exaggerated by Jews in order to, to um, you know, promote sympathy for Israel. And he's, he, just, he discovered many things which I thought were interesting, some of them semi-interesting and some, some of them dubious. Um, so I wasn't completely taken in by all of his arguments. But one of the most interesting things that he found was that he, he, he said that there's, and, and you know, I haven't verified this. I am not saying this is true. Um, maybe you've been there yourself and, and, you, and you know what he's talking about, Alex. I'll be interested to, to find out in, in a moment. But he said that he went to one of the Auschwitz uh, gas chambers and found that a door to the gas chamber only open inwards and could be locked only from the inside so that anybody who was put in what was you know purported to be a gas chamber would have been able to open the door from the inside and no one could have stopped them from getting out now i do think that that's interesting and bearing in mind what you've told me it does seem to be the case that there's something there, doesn't it, that, that the authorities are trying to stop people from finding out. So, you know, may, maybe there is something to this idea that, uh, you know, that the that the Jewish political lobby, shall we put it that way, um, has, uh, you know, e e exaggerated perhaps, uh, you know, the, the number of Jews killed or, or, or something like that. Part of the problem with dead bodies is that it's very difficult to say, well, you know, that's a gypsy, that's a homosexual, that's a Pole, that's a Czechoslovakian, uh, that's something else. Uh, that there is, is definitely a, a, a dead Jew. It's very difficult at times to, you know, to separate one, one from the other. But I think it's going to be very, very difficult. You know, so, so many people use this expression, hollow hoax. But I think it's going to be very difficult at this remove to, um, you know, to, to prove, uh, I, I think, that, uh, well, well, to prove how much of, what we now regard as the Holocaust has has been exaggerated or 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 not, but uh, but I'm very glad that you've 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 brought that up that that you can only wander around with a guide, and that you can't question <laughs> anything they say. I will absolutely have to get myself out there as soon as I can and see how they treat me. <laughs> that that will be my next uh, trip, Alex. I think I that, I, sh I shall have to uh, go out and. and question and i'll switch concentration camp guide <laughs> you know i when i went there i didn't have any questioning in mind so that sign that that's why i remember it so clearly because when i saw that sign i went what and then when i went walked around with the guide and she was telling me this is this and this is that i i kept saying 
how do you know that? Because because of the sign. That's the only reason I had those questions. And she started getting annoyed with me. But uh, if they hadn't, for I mean, maybe I'm different than most people. But if I had not seen that sign, I wouldn't have questioned anything. It, it was the sign that made me question. But just to be clear, I don't. I I believe there was a Holocaust and. Also, some people, when they say, oh, it was only 3 million, it was not 6 million, it doesn't really matter. It's still uh, millions of people. Exactly, Alex. I mean, that, that's why I think at times it, 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 it gets so ridiculous. And I do think at times that it is part of the disinformation machine. Because if you ever turn around and say that the Holocaust is fake and it's a myth and all the rest of it, they then, you see, have got you. Because they can, I mean, I mean if, if, if I was ever to say that, they can splash it across the, the internet, you know, all, all over the world. Whoa, you know, FRC is a, is a Holocaust denier. I'm not a Holocaust denier at all. I would say to anybody who is a Holocaust denier, how in the hell can you explain those horrible images of bulldozers bulldozing millions of, of, of bodies? Now, you know, a lot of people have said, oh, well, you know, they were just typhus victims or the... You know, there was some disease in the camp or, 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 you know, something stupid like that. If you look at the amount of bodies, you know, you know, why would they want to feel that they had to bulldoze them in, in the first place? And let, let me also add that when you are at Auschwitz, you can actually, you can feel the energy. It's not a good energy there. I mean, you can just feel that it, it was a horrible place. And uh, so, yeah, so I, I don't, den- I, I never denied the Holocaust. It's more about who paid for it, you know? Well, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, and that, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that um, people, are, uh, because of my movie, that people are beginning to wonder, um, you know, who, who was truly responsible for the Holocaust. I don't see how you can argue much with um, the movie uh, Judgment in Nuremberg there's a, a moment in that <clears throat> in that movie where Richard Widmark um, is saying that the, you know the six million figure was the Germans own figures and those figures you would think would have been highly accurate because that was the you know the, the whole point of the IBM machines putting the tattoo mark on you know everybody on, on everybody's arms and again that's in my movie the children showing the tattoo mark on their arms um you know they did that to count them very very accurately and you know judge, judgment in at nuremberg was made a long time ago and it was made uh, you know an awful long time <clears throat> before anybody had seen my movie and before you know anybody had started to question who was truly behind the holocaust i mean you know in the film Judgment in Nuremberg, you know, it, it's assumed then that it was, you know, purely and simply the Germans. And and that was why the, you know, the speech uh, in my film, which, uh, you know, Maximilian Schell did so brilliantly, uh, where he, you know, brings into uh, question the complicity of um, American industrialists and, you know, other figures, world leaders like Winston Churchill, etc. Uh, that's why that segment is so important and, and so fascinating but i don't think that uh, as i say in terms of figures i don't, I don't really see how how anybody can uh, can argue with what was read out at, at you know the the original nuremberg trials uh, you know the, those people were professional legal people and, and they and they had access to the original records so i, I don't see how anybody can uh, argue with the figures I don't see how anybody in, in, in their right mind could look at all of the, the those horrible images, the, the mass graves, the mountains of corpses, the, the, the corpses being bulldozed into the ground. It doesn't matter how they died. They obviously died in the camps. And if that's not genocide, then what is, you know? So, you know, I, I don't see uh, how anybody can go on with this hollow hoax idea. If people want to argue that there was some, you know, that, that, that Zionists, if you want to use that expression, and it's not one that I like using, um, but if you want to argue that they have uh, exaggerated uh, the Jewish suffering for political ends, what I would say to anybody like that is, you know, I've got an open mind and I'm always prepared to, to listen. 
that's that's how any true historian uh, and any true thinker uh, ought to be. If you've got any evidence of, of that, show me the evidence. I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to look at it. You know, um, there definitely has been <coughs> skullduggery uh, by, uh, I'm going to have to say flat out, Israel um, in, in the past uh, to whip up sympathy for them uh, as, as a country. They've done it in, in many different ways. So perhaps there is some, uh, you know, um, conspiracy to use uh, the, the Holocaust as, as a political weapon that favours uh, is Israel. But I would like to see more, you know, facts and evidence rather than um, opinion. And it's also funny that like you know because uh, George Bush's grandfather had Nazi gold in the bank and and that's not you know uh, controversial but that Donald Trump is grabbing pussies is controversial <laughs> it's funny how the media works you know well well exactly Alex I mean I, I mean you know I've discussed this several times now Richie Allen um, I think has done a very good job in trying to get it across to people that the news is not the news. You know, what, what we get from mainstream media, you know, oh, good evening, everybody, it's six o'clock, and, and here's, the, here's the news. It's not news. It's a soap opera. It's a soap opera which in many cases is written two years before the event. You know, and all they want with Donald Trump, I, I, I tried to talk about this in my last interview, all they want with Trump and all the rest of them is just that you should think about them. You know, talk about them. Yes, I acknowledge the fact that they are there. What they don't want is for people to just completely ignore the politicians and to ignore what is essentially a Muppet show for adults because that's all the news is. It is just there to distract you and mislead you. So, you know, as you say, don't take any notice about, you know, so Trump's grabbing pussy again. That's just something to, you know, to lead you down the primrose path. Don't take any notice of that. As you say, Alex, do your own research and look at the fact that, you know, the Bush family were in bed with the Nazis from the very beginning. For me personally, I I, I, I feel most well psychologically by not watching the news at all. <laughs> I just check in now and again just to make sure there's no nuclear bombs dropping or something like that. So uh, if 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 people want to f- see your film, I guess they can just uh, find it very easily on YouTube. Or do you have a website dedicated to it as well? Well, I mean, I think it's so well known now, uh, Alex. I mean, the thing is, um, because of the, you know they've allowed, if, if if I want to put it that way, if I, if I can put it that way, um, I think it's now it's it's almost five million. Um, hits on my original version. Um, and because of that, you only have to type in JFK to 9-11 into Google and it, 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 it pops right up. So, um, you know, anybody, you know, who might be hearing this for the, the, the first time, I don't think it's exactly um, I don't think it's exactly difficult to find. I'm still very amused by, by the fact that people have stolen it and put it out under different titles without ever... <laughs> Without ever asking my permission, it's like, well, you know, what does that man matter? He only wrote it and directed <laughs> the, the, the damn thing. Why should I ask his permission? It's it it's it, it amuses me. I mean, there's a version called America's Hideous Past and Sinister Future, and I think that one's all, almost got a million hits of its own now. And uh, and there's an, another version, and there's two versions of it uh, by this man Shane Seavey, who added an hour to my work and a lot of people have criticized him for it but he calls his JFK to 9-11 unfortunate truth um, you know you, you can watch any of them Any anybody looking for um, you know a, a conspiracy uh, film to you know to, to try and find out what's really going on right now I don't think it would take them long to find my movie even if they hadn't um, heard of it and I'm very glad about that I don't agree about changing the title or removing your name and those things, but isn't it good that many people download it and re-upload it? Because then it now it's like practically impossible to remove it from in, from the internet. 
Oh yeah, yes. I mean, I I, I did say this um, on Justin Stellman's show. I mean, I, when I was uh, Justin Stellman uh, was talking with me, uh, I was mentioning this man Mick Thorne, uh, who I think is a, a very good man. He's a, you know he's a, he's a nice man. He's the one who's taken ten minute segments, fifteen minute segments of my picture, and he's put them out, and uh, and and you know he's accrued huge. Massive amount of hits, and I've no doubt as well that he he's uh, helped people to get into it because um, when it, when it, when it was first put out, a lot of people said, "Whoa, come on, <laughs> three and a half hours!" Of, uh, you know, I'm not going to bother with that for three and a half hours. But the fact that he put out little snippets as teasers to get people into it, I think did help. So uh, maybe it's an opportunity for me to thank Rick Thorne and all those other people. Who've uh, <laughs> I've got to say stolen it without my, without my permission and, uh, and and put it out there. But yes, it it, it has helped, and I, and I also think it does show you, Alex, that um, you know that how much people believe in it, and and it it shows you why again and again and again people have uh, you know written blogs and and done all kinds of journalism. On this, and, and it's true of the public comments as well. Over and over and over again, people have said, you know, this movie is just so mega important. Every man, woman, and child on earth needs to see this film. You know, th th that has happened again and again and again. And, uh, you know, th th this is why, you know, I wish there was more outrage uh, about the fact that the establishment are, are trying so hard to stop every man, woman, and child on earth from, uh, from seeing it. I th for me, this film has always been a the, la the last part of a trilogy, where which is connected to a sort of become an internet tradition. The first one many many years ago was this Zeitgeist film that was the first one of its kind, and uh, uh, and then after that came the Loose Change one, which was also and then you then this one that you made. Yeah, so, yeah, a few people have said this. Yeah, um, a, people, a lot of people have asked me, you know, if I know Peter Joseph and if I'd seen Zeitgeist before I made my movie. I really didn't. I really didn't. I'd seen uh, Loose Change, and um, you know, I take my hat off to Dylan Avery because he was so young when he made uh, Loose Change, and it's a brilliant movie. Um, I'm, I'm sad uh, a little for him that. Um, Oh, you know, he put himself in a position because he thought the aircraft, uh, or th th that he thought that there were aircraft involved in the attack and that the aircraft had been radio controlled. Um, and so because of that, you know, because the American establishment knew that that wasn't the case and that there were no planes involved, um, they thought that, you know, maybe he wasn't that bright. And, and they made, uh, I mean, the BBC made several films about this change and about Dylan Avery. Um, to try and discredit him um, b because, uh, you know, they knew that there were parts of it that, it that he hadn't got right. But I still regard Loose Change as one of the great, you know, and most important films uh, of, of all time. Uh, you know, I, I really do. He did a, f a fantastic job. And, you know, you've got to ask yourself, you know, where would we be now and what, what kind of, Public perception would there be of this whole issue uh, had he not made that uh, picture? And for any young person out there who's listening to my voice right now, um, I would like them to take heart <clears throat> from the fact that Dylan Avery was a film school reject. <laughs> they thought he wasn't good enough to allow to train. Uh, so that he could possibly make feature films in the in the future, and so you know, once he'd been uh, rejected from film school, he just went ahead and made this little thing called Loose Change and changed the world. And all I can say to Dylan Avery is, my friend, I take my hat off to you. Well done. What sold me on the 9/11? Because I remember when I experienced it happening in real time. I from the first m second that I saw the image images and the way the CNN and all those news channels were reporting it, it smelled fishy from the beginning. But the thing that really made me convinced that there was something wrong was when they said that 
in that blazing inferno they found the a fully unharmed passport you know <laughs> I mean, it's isn't it daft, Alex? Isn't it that we can laugh about it? And I've no doubt that there are millions of people, you know, listening to this, or millions of people who will, who laugh about it just as hard because it it does just look so utterly stupid now. Doesn't it? I mean, how could they be that stupid? That to, to, to think that, that that adults would swallow the idea that well, well, well that paper doesn't burn, <laughs> especially in a, in a, as you say in a, in a fireball. Um, you know, but you know, it it just shows you that um, I, I was having a conversation with um, Charles Ewing Smith, um, the uh, the movie director. Um, I was talking to him, uh, you know, from Hollywood uh, just a couple of days ago. Uh, you know, about this, and uh, you know, he he was the the same from the very beginning, thinking, you know, this is just. This, the, I mean, he was saying to me, it underlined the fact that truly the oligarchs are not that bright. They're, they're, they're really not that clever. If they were that clever, they wouldn't get caught all the time with their trousers down. They've been, they've been caught with their trousers down end, endlessly. You know, they're, they're not that clever. And they're not... If, 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 if there's one thing possibly we might take hope from, I think that the... Um, you know all of the things that have leaked out to show the world that uh, that these acts are, are phony. Um, it shows that they're not as in control as they think they are. <clears throat> I have a young friend who saw um, some video that was taken after the what was allegedly the the Manchester uh, terror attack, and he thought that one of the people who'd been a paid actor in that terror attack or phony terror attack, I should say, uh, had taken uh, the video in a surreptitious way because the phone is always sort of half-pointed at the floor. And then he'd done it to show people just how ridiculous it, it was. I mean, there's the foyer at Manchester just a few moments after what was supposed to be a huge bomb. And there's no bodies. There's no glass. All the lights are still on. How, how, how can all the lights still be on if there's just been a bomb, for God's sake? And all of the people who are walking around are just shuffling around as if they're, they're doing their shopping. There's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of anything. You know, it's, it's, it's obviously uh, a hoax. And, and you can see it in, in that video um, very clearly that, it, that it's uh, a hoax. And, it, you know, it makes you think that the person who did it had been paid to be part of it and had become disgusted with themselves and took some video to show that it was a, a, a hoax. So, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. I really wouldn't be with the way that things were, uh, are going. I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised if the next terror attack that they've got ready to stage with a load of actors, I wouldn't be surprised if, if all of those actors turned up to the scene and... and you know, say that they'd been paid to lie around on the floor covered in blood, uh, fake blood, let's say, uh, when the cameras turn up. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if a big group of actors said, you know, this has gone far enough. And they all jumped up and said, look, look, look we're all alive and it's all a hoax. <laughs> and, and, you know, don't believe this world because we've been paid to do this. I mean, they even if they've had their lives threatened, they may think, well, you know, this can't go on any longer. And if we do this as a group, they can't kill us all. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if the next few terror attacks, um, you know, were, were undermined by people who've been paid to perform them, um, you know, basically ratted out their their masters. That, that wouldn't surprise me at all. But there is also can be, you know, you can you can have a false flag terrorist attack where you have with the you know even manchester it could there could be you know real people who are victims the false flag is that they either knew that they were doing it and they ignored it because they thought oh it's good if they do that terrorist attack or they did it did it themselves so there's many um paths you can take if you are the oligarchs uh, so there's you know in the end you know if you kill a few people innocent people it doesn't matter to them you know well alex my big fear is that because of men like me 
you know, yourself and, and, you know, Richie Allen and Justin Stellman and me and, you know, all these people who are examining the phony terrorist acts and finding, you know, holes everywhere. My big fear is that the oligarchs being as crazy as they are, <clears throat> that they're going to do something absolutely crazy where they do, you know, really kill a, a massive load of, of, of people and film it for just, just for the sake of authenticity. I mean, over and over again, men like you have said, well, look, you know, look, look, look at this, look at this. This is supposed to be a truck running people over. And there's never in this world that's covered in CCTV, there's cameras everywhere. There's never authentic footage of a truck actually hitting a pedestrian and knocking them over. You know, they always show us the aftermath as they did on London Bridge with the, you know, the, the body underneath the bus or the truck or, or, or whatever. And it's always a dummy. And it's always very easy for critics like you and I to dismiss. So, you know, it, it, I do wonder if they're building up to, uh, to do something like, you know, get a real, say, oil tanker to, you know, plow into, uh, you know, a, a, a real group of football fans or, or something like that, just so that they can put it on the news and say, look, you know, I, 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 this is real and, and, and this proves it. it you know, it, it's something that they would consider, bearing in mind all of the, you know, the, the, the criticism of the phony terror has been so effective. I do think it's, that it, it's something that, that they would consider doing, you know, or maybe bringing a, an airliner down, you know, with, with a blowpipe missile or, or something like that over London. So that everybody saw the the crash, they might consider doing that, and I just hope that if they ever do, that people see through it, because when they do, there'll be holes in that story. If you go looking for them, don't you think the oligarchs have a big, a lot of faith in that the majority of people accept the news? <sighs> well, you see, Alex, uh, you know. <laughs> Young people who I talk to, and I'm, I'm meaning now people in their early 20s, generally seem to agree that of all of the people that they know, they tend to say that 70 to 80 percent of them know something's not right here. Now, that doesn't mean to say that everybody's a truther. The thing that frustrates most of my young friends is that people, in spite of this fact, still want to be ostriches and bury their heads in the sand and say, look, you know, <clears throat> I can't figure this out. Uh, you know, that's why I made my movie. That, because I wanted people to understand what was going on. And the thing that, that I was most grateful for in my last interview with Adam and John, and that's on Magical Mystery Media, if anybody wants to listen to it, the thing I was most grateful about uh, with those two gentlemen was they they said, you know, pretty much verbatim to this, that what I've done is to give people the big picture. And that was what I was trying to do, to give people the big picture. Um, one of them compared it in, in, the, in the previous review to being a footballer who's on a, you know, a football pitch and trying to, you know, see where the openings are and one thing or another. And, and that what my movie had done was to place people in the stand where they could see the whole game for what it is that that is you know what i was trying to trying to do this is you know this is what, I, what i'm trying to get a, across to people is is the true nature of the the big oligarch hoax and the fact that our entire capitalist system is is uh, is is one big hoax and that uh, you see what what i'm hoping that um people will will take from it is it, something that they can spread around to those people who because they feel they have a lack of intellect because that's always what it's about alex it's people who are, who have a lack of intellect who switch off their tvs and people who you know who, who think that they're not that bright who can't confront the reality of this they're, they're the people who who don't look into it it's people it, they're afraid of, of embarrassing themselves because this thing is so complicated 
they, they, they just can't, you know, get into it. And uh, but as I've said before, everybody feels in their bones there's something not right here. Even the most ignorant people know something's not right here. And when they hear the news, okay, there's the news, and there's another terrorist attack. But they don't believe it. They've heard it, and they've heard, you know, one particular version of reality. But the vast majority of people don't believe it. They don't necessarily research what's going wrong. They bury their heads in the sand, but they they don't believe it. And when you have a situation like that, as I've said before to, in other interviews, it can so easily turn into a, a tinderbox situation. Ignorant people do not like being misled because it makes them confront their own ignorance. It makes them angry. And it could make them turn very easily and very quickly. If, if some event, you know, sparked in just the right way, the whole of the Western world could turn into a tinderbox, uh, you know, of, of, of anger. And, and that really, I don't make any bones about it, is, uh, is, what, is what I'm hoping for. Um, but, you know, I, I think at the moment that about, I think that somewhere between a quarter and a third of the people in the Western world now have looked at, you know, to, to, let's say tried to find out the, the truth. At some time in their life, whether it's been watching my film or Loose Change or Zeitgeist or, you know, Dave Von Kleist's movie. Or I, I think that about a third of them have have tried to, to find the truth. And most of those people, well, definitely those people, generally speaking, will be professionals and they'll be the intelligentsia. And that's an awful lot of people, Alex, that we've got on our side. You know, the oligarchs are not underreporting the hits on my movie by at least 200 times for no reason. There definitely are millions and millions and millions of people in the English-speaking world who know that it's, it's all fake. If I could get my movie translated into all of the European languages, it would be a, make another colossal difference. And, and it, would, it would then turn into billions of people on the planet who know that there's something wrong. And if we can do this, if we can get to a stage where there are billions of professionals in, in the world who are all united in, in, in their belief that there's something wrong here and, and that we're being lied to and that all the governments are phony and that all the terror attacks are phony, then I do think there'll be political change. I, I can't see how they can resist that and resist that forever. One final uh, question. If somebody that hasn't seen your film or maybe they have seen it but you know after they they finished watching it and they go okay that's not good uh you know but what can i do you know what 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 advice would you give to those people well the, i would say to those people look you've got to take responsibility the public have got to take responsibility for themselves there are millions of people and you're one of them in the western world now who are trying to do something about this. Now, I realize fully that not everybody's got the time because, you know, some people are worn out from work and, you know, there are single mothers and there are, you know, people with six children and, and, and all the rest of it in this world. I realize that we, maybe we can't all make the same contribution. But I've said before that in order to take responsibility for themselves, the public at this moment are duty-bound to find out what is going on, really, And that's not difficult, Alex. It really isn't. In this age when all you've got to do is type false flag terrorism into YouTube and there are all these wonderful videos by all these fantastic amateur detectives which can prove to you over and over again that Manchester and the Boston bombing and Brussels and Paris and, you know, everywhere else, and, and especially 9-11, is all fake. And once you've realized that, you know, You've got to do something. Now, it may be something as little as donating $5 to my next film or somebody else's next film. Okay, maybe it's as, as, as little as that. But really, truly, at this moment in time, every concerned adult in the Western world should be prepared to write 
to their congressman or their local politician or to their prime minister or president or whatever and say to them, look, sunshine, you haven't fooled me. I know what's going on and I want this stopped. There's a declaration of principle on my website, which is everything is a rich man's trick dot webs dot com. And people write to me all the time saying just one thing. I agree, because that was why I set that up. I simply wanted people to read that declaration of principle, which is that it's time for revolution. It is time to completely change the system. Time to get rid of Western governments altogether. And people write to me all the time, basically just saying, OK, I agree. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the powers that be will be manipulating that website. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they are. But everybody should write to me to say, I agree, if they do. And everybody should be prepared to take action to get rid of this appalling tyranny that we're living under now. You, I would say to them, you've got to take responsibility for yourself. Do something because every little helps if you if you establish um you know a, a truth activists group i mean i've just been contacted for the first time uh, from new zealand by this very uh, pleasant man uh, peter littlewood uh, uh, you know i'd like to uh, thank him if he ever hears this interview because he wrote me a very funny letter in which he said he he basically uh, dug a trench and wore the carpet out in front of the television uh, walking back and forwards, watching my movie and taking notes <laughs> and, and, and trying to, you know, research it uh, to, to, to see that, that everything in it was, was true. And he found out that everything in it was true, um, you know, and he's got together with uh, a big group of other New Zealanders. Um, and, and he's saying, you know, as soon as you want to make another film, we'll, we'll all support you financially, you know, as much as, as, as we can. He is doing something. If everybody had his attitude, we could end this tyranny so easily. You know, if, if everybody had that attitude, the, the, the oligarchs wouldn't survive uh, very much longer. At the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, and in the final analysis, Alex, no matter what I do, no matter how powerful my films are, no matter how devastating people find them, it will in the end be up to the public. And if the public, you know, do nothing, then this is going to continue and you know you we've got to keep reminding people that the only thing that's necessary for bad men to rule is for good men to do nothing so if, if people out there think that they're decent and they want to live a decent life then they've got to do something they've got to take responsibility and i hope that they will great uh, thanks a lot for taking the time to talk to me well, you're very welcome, my friend. It's been very interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm, re I'm, I'm, you know, delighted to find out what, what I found out about uh, Auschwitz. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to get there because it's, it's, it's very difficult at the moment with, uh, for a lot of reasons uh, that I won't go into. But uh, you know, I will have to, I will have to go there. And, uh, and uh, mind you, <laughs> I'm Francis Richard Colney. Maybe, maybe they won't even let me in the gates. <laughs> we'll have to see.